My name is Gopi Shaw. I'm a pediatric ENT, and I have an awesome guest today. I have Dr. Megan Durr. Welcome to the show, Megan. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much, Gopi. In terms of sleep apnea in women, is that something, did you notice that there may be a difference between men and women? Like, was this something that you noticed early on, like in your residency from your mentor or once you started practicing? Yeah. So interesting question. It was not something I really thought about. And I feel like at first it kind of came on my radar when I was pregnant. So I have three young kids, five, four, and one. And so I've been pregnant a lot the past like five, six years, as have a lot of my friends. And everyone knew I did a lot of sleep apnea surgery and had an interest in sleep apnea and snoring. So, so many of my friends when they were pregnant would come to me and say, Megan, I am snoring. It is horrible. I'm waking myself up. My bed partner can't sleep in the same room. I'm exhausted. And this was happening fairly regularly to the point where I was like, what is going on? Is this just my friends or something? Because I started looking into it. And I would also say, I also had a lot of colleagues, friends and patients kind of going through menopause. And I noticed that during that time also, it was a tough time for sleep. I mean, I think on top of the hot flashes and everything that comes with menopause, people certainly do develop other sleep disorders, including sleep apnea around this time, which got me really thinking, is this something different? And why are we not really talking about this or thinking about it? It was also interesting that I started to notice that a lot of my patients were men too. And I was wondering kind of what happened? Where are the women going? They're clearly struggling. So they're coming to me out in the community, just asking, you know, friends and colleagues asking me, but I'm not seeing as many women in clinic. And I think the same goes for kind of underrepresented minorities too, I would say. In my practice, the majority, not all, but the majority of people that I see were men, middle-aged, white, fairly health literate. Um, And it it made me kind of get more interested in where are the other people going? They clearly have sleep apnea. Why are they not making it to this point where they're looking into sleep surgery? And that led into some research interests uh, of mine, including kind of women and underrepresented minorities and barriers to care for sleep apnea. No, I think that's that's great because I, I feel like I used to always think of it more as a, you know, higher incidence in men. And so, you know, when we were corresponding, I'm like, hey, let's do this podcast. I'm like, oh, I was seeing women like I didn't even think about it. So to me, it, it's very new. So have you found like, are, are we just missing women? Um, are the symptoms different? Are they not being referred? Do we know the true incidence? Yeah. So I think probably all of these things and kind of the interesting thing is there is not a lot of literature on this topic, which is kind of crazy to think about. I mean, when we're talking underrepresented minorities and all women, this is a large portion of our population that we just kind of don't really know. But there is some information. So I would say getting at missed diagnosis, almost certainly, I think the the data is, is pretty clear that we are missing a lot of people with sleep apnea, but women probably are uh, disproportionately being impacted by this misdiagnosis. And I think it's some of the reasons and many of which you mentioned, one is symptoms. So women, I think we all, then I used to think of sleep apnea symptoms as the, you know, coming in with snoring, falling asleep during the day, super tired, bed partner, witnessing apneas, choking, gasping at night. And this is actually not what women usually present with. This is kind of more typical of a male presentation. And so I think when people go to their PCP with those symptoms, which is usually the men, they're more alerted to, hey, let's get a sleep study. And so women, in contrast, present more with like mental fogginess, memory issues, fragmented sleep, insomnia. And those are kind of more vague symptoms. So I think a lot of times they come in and it's usually to the PCP at this point, right? saying these things and they're thinking more like anxiety, depression, hypothyroid, other and kind of sleep apnea is not necessarily the first thing that jumps out to them. So I think that's kind of one huge area that's causing us to miss women. I think another thing is these screening questionnaires that we do. So like the stop bang is probably the most common one that we know about used by anesthesiologists primarily when people are in a kind of perioperative clinic getting evaluated. And so those are screening for male symptoms, right? So if you think about 
stop bang, they're mostly looking at kind of sleepiness. So S is sleepiness and, and tiredness, or S is snore, sorry, S is snoring, T is tiredness, O is witnessed obstruction, choking, gasping, all these things we talked about that males present with. So there's not much data on this, but I have to believe that using these questionnaires that assess mostly these obstructive symptoms, sleepiness symptoms, are missing a lot of women and they're just not getting alerted to the fact that this might be obstructive sleep apnea. Are any like uh, stop bang, uh, Epworth sleepiness, like any of these sleep surveys, are they validated separately based on sex or gender? No, no. And so that's, I, I think that is huge. It's something I'm interested in looking at. Do we need to either validate these women or do we need like a totally different survey that asks for some of these more atypical or vague symptoms that women present with? Because I think if we looked, I would have to guess that again, we would, we're missing women when we use these specific symptoms for us. Yeah. And it's funny, you know, you mentioned um, men coming to your office uh, or, you know, I, I think of the primary care office, whether, you know, general ENT clinic and, you know, maybe I'm more inclined as a physician too to ask the male patients about sleep apnea because I assume that maybe, you know, the woman who's may not be, be as high risk, I just maybe have a inherent bias because I just see it more in men too. Like, I don't know. Do you think that might play a role too? And just in terms of what we're looking for? <laughs> yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I, I think we all, when we think of sleep apnea, think of like an overweight middle-aged man, unfortunately, is kind of what, yeah. what comes to mind and is probably in all the textbooks. But that does not mean that women don't suffer from this. So the studies do show that is more common. I mean, it certainly is more common in men than women, but it, there are a lot of women that certainly suffer from this. When you look at, so they've done these big epidemiological kind of longitudinal population studies, like Wisconsin Sleep Cohort or Sleep Park Health Study, where they just follow people for a long time, give them sleep studies, see who develops sleep apnea, see what the natural history of their sleep apnea is. Those show that it's like a two to three to one ratio. So certainly more common in men. So men, like two to three men per one women will have sleep apnea. And so certainly more common in men, but not to be discounted in women. Interestingly, when we look clinically, so when patients actually come to their PCP and get diagnosed, that's the study show more like an eight to one men to women oh, wow. ratio. And so when we just screen women without asking about symptoms, just you know across the board screen them or finding that it actually is more common in women than when we're relying on our current screening and testing mechanisms clinically, which is also kind of interesting, I think. Yeah. So you'd mentioned um, some of the symptoms like mental fogginess, insomnia, foggy memory, you know, or, you know, there, I, I think about that because I'm like, you know, that could be just me being, you know, middle age mom of two, like trying to keep up, right? Like, that, and that, that's just not a normal symptom. Like, and you're right, there's so many different things that can be going on or um, can be happening. So, you know, when you do have somebody um, in your clinic, or maybe by the time they see you, maybe they've already had a sleep study. Um, but I feel like that differential, and you kind of mentioned it, it could be so many different things. What What is kind of in that differential or that we need to add sleep apnea on that list of stuff? Absolutely. Yeah. And so I think I'm a little bit lucky in that we mostly require that people come to my clinic, have a sleep study. So I kind of get to look at that. Although we can talk about this. There are issues with the way sleep studies are graded that might uh, not be as inclusive of women. So I think we also have to look carefully at the sleep studies to make sure that we are including women that have slightly different findings on sleep studies. But if I see, say I didn't have the sleep study, but if I see a woman who's explaining these types of symptoms, describing some sleep fragmentation, the mental fogginess, I will always recommend a sleep study and not just assume that this is insomnia or something else, because I think it's important that we also look for that and assess for that. Certainly, many of these people have comorbid insomnia and sleep apnea, but I think we should not just call it insomnia and move on because we could very well be missing OSA because, as we talked about, these women are presenting with some of these more atypical symptoms. 
In terms of um, like long-term effects um, of OSA on women, is it similar as some of the long-term effects that we normally think of, of, you know, potential, depending on how severe it is, even like right-sided heart heart failure, does it present similar or are we, you know, I I think of like coronary artery disease um, and, you know, now we're more aware of about its risk in women. How do, how does, in terms of long-term effects of long-term OSA on a woman, what, what are some of the risks or other complications, comorbidities can they develop? Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you mentioned the cardiovascular comparison to this because I think it is quite similar. We now know that women also present differently with heart attack and may miss heart attacks. And I think this is kind of a very similar scenario. So the long-term side effects for OSA, cardiovascular risk, diabetes, hypertension, even dementia, there are some Kind of emerging studies that show women probably have higher risk of some of the cardiovascular complications from OSA, which is very interesting. So that's congestive heart failure, even kind of mortality from congestive heart failure, hypertension, probably are more prevalent in women with OSA than men. And we don't really know why. I think this is really interesting and especially important because like we talked about, we're missing the diagnosis in many of these women. And then we also know they're probably at more increased risk of some of these cardiovascular complications, which is scary. And I think it means we need to step it up and, and just do better assessing and screening and diagnosing these women so they can get the treatment that they deserve. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable ENT on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable ENT is hosted by Gopi Shaw and Ashley Agan. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross. Josh Spencer. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. With support from Taylor's version Hess. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Administrative support provided by Jimmy Lee Thanks again for listening and see you next week.